are true worshipers? Uh, that's starting in your notes on page 330. That's a very important question because only true worshipers are going to go to heaven. Jesus said that. Uh, those who get to heaven are those who worship God in spirit and in truth. In fact, worship or submission to God is the central theme of the Bible. In Revelation 22, verse 9, I'll read it to you. It says, then the angel said to me, see that you do not do that. John was overwhelmed in his tour of heaven. He fell down at the feet of an angel because angels are so glorious and beautiful. He just, they're so great that he just fell down. And the angel said, don't do that. He said, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. And look at verse 9, the end. Worship God. The bottom line, worship God. The message of the eternal gospel is worship God. And we'll cover this. There's coming a point when everything is so bad in the tribulation, people are dying so fast, hailstones, stones are going to fall from heaven that weigh between 60 and 100 pounds. And they're going to be dropping on every part of the earth. It's going to be squashing people, breaking buildings, going to be crushing their cars if there are any cars left. The sun is going to be burning people, it's so hot. And in that horrible time, an angel is sent by God, and the angel flies over the earth and tells everybody how to get saved. And one of the elements is worship God. A theology of true worship is what you have in Revelation 4 and 5. Now, what does the Bible teach us are the foundations? What, what is biblical worship built on? That starts on page 338. Basically, Jesus said when... He was talking to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus said to her for, that God is a spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now see, there are a lot of emotional people in worship, but God was talking about in spirit, which means the only way you can worship God is to have the Holy Spirit within you. So you have to worship energized by the Holy Spirit, and that's wonderful, but you have to worship based on truth. Now, in Christianity, we have the charismatics who are very, very uh, charismatic. The charismatics who are very much emphasizing the Holy Spirit, but they're often very light on the truth. So they have this exciting worship that's very often uh, away from what the Bible says. Then we have over here, you know, the, a lot of the evangelicals that, that uh, they're really tight on what the Bible says. But they're so dead. There's no spirit. It's like, you know, there's nothing exciting about their worship because they're, they're so preoccupied with truth that they don't, they don't surrender to the Spirit. And this side, they're so preoccupied with the Spirit, they're not even aware of truth. And the Lord says, true worship is both. That's the purpose of God's Word. The purpose of God's Word is to, to give us what's right, what's wrong, how to get right, how to stay right. And so what the Lord wants is worship offered by a surrendered believer. That's why... Romans 12 says, it's our true spiritual worship. Paul adds this, and I'll read to you Philippians 3.3. 3. He says, this, this is who worships God. Philippians 3 and verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3.3 3 explains salvation. For we are the circumcision. What is that? That is surgery, but in the context of our heart. See, the only way you get saved is you get a new heart. And the only way you get a new heart, Paul knew, is because Ezekiel 36 says God will give us a new heart. So we are the circumcision, we have a new heart, who worship God in the spirit. When we get a new heart, we get the spirit. 
who rejoice in Christ Jesus, it says in Philippians 3.3, 3, and have no confidence in the flesh. And so basically, beware of fleshly worship. God wants humility. That's why one of the hardest things to do is to be a worship leader, especially if you've got a guitar or a microphone, because it's very hard not to show off. It's very hard not to want people to think you're you know, great in some way. It, God says, beware of fleshly worship, and that's why he gives us in Revelation the elements, what he's looking for. And so what are those elements? Well, we read already um, this passage, and uh, keep going in your notes. I will summarize it for you. So what, what does worship God is looking for look like? Number one, it starts and flows from the words God gave us. That's why the book of Revelation says, I gave you this, this book, it's for my servants. Why? One element is so we know what God likes in worship. What he wants, he wrote down. True worshipers come boldly to offer acceptable worship because they come, look at this, in the spirit. We are those, remember it says, God is a spirit, knows that worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Paul says, for we're the circumcision, we have a new heart, we worship God in the spirit. True acceptable worship is not when we come emotionally alone, but when we come in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now you remember my little funny stick figure I drew here, you know, the person, um, and I said that they have the Holy Spirit inside of them, and he can be grieved and quenched. Well, God wants us to come filled with the Spirit, unquenched, ungrieved. What's the goal? Verse 17 of Revelation 1, we long to see Christ's beauty, and when we see him, like John, we fall before him. I'll never forget pastoring in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We had this guy. He was a character, but he got saved. He's one of these people that had never cut his hair, I don't think, in his life. His hair was all the way down. He could sit on it. He was really a character. He, he dressed funny, he looked funny, but someone brought him into the church. He came to know the Lord, he loved the Lord, and I'll never forget, I started preaching about this, and it said that, uh, I was preaching through Revelation, I said, and when John saw Jesus as he was, he fell on his face. And all of a sudden, I heard people making sounds. He got right down on his face in the aisle and put his forehead down on the ground, right in the middle of the service. And afterward, I asked him why he did that. He said, because, because I saw him too. I saw Jesus too. And I thought, do we do stuff like that? No, we don't do stuff like that. It's all, you know, it's just we know all this. This guy was so new, if someone loved the Lord and fell on their face, he wanted to do it too. See, that's the kind of worship that God loves. Uh, fourthly, we worship the way God's word instructs us because we know Christ is always watching. That's what uh, Revelation 2.23 says, he's watching. We know our worship rises to merge around the throne because all those bowls are there. All of our worship, our prayers, our offerings, God's collecting. What he's saying is, when you worship on earth, it merges with what I'm doing in heaven. And true worshipers focus on, on putting the spotlight on God. See, that's, again, what happens in our modern worship is the, the, it's dark in the auditorium, and all of a sudden you start hearing the guitars, and all of a sudden they step forward, and the spotlight goes on who? The lead singers. Do you know what would be neat? To start the worship service and have a cross on the wall, put the spotlight up there, and you never see the faces of all those musicians. See, that's more of the way it is in heaven. The spotlight is on God, not on us. And that's, that's just the way God intended it to be. Okay, that's how far behind we were. Now, 11 minutes, we're, we're into our last hour. In our last hour, for the last time, context is vital. For the rest of your life, remember that. Always remember the context of Revelation is that Jesus is coming and visiting the church after two generations and looking whether they were obedient. We've come to the second section of Revelation. Uh, Lord willing, on Tuesday, we'll get to the third section. Um, that is reminding us we've come to this part 
where the church is in heaven surrounding the throne. And what does the church do? Let's go to Revelation chapter 5. And we're going to read the first nine verses. And I'm going to ask for volunteers. So uh, how about we just make it easy? 5 1, 5 2, 5. Is that you from right here? 5 3. Lydia, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and I get to read 9, okay? So follow along in your Bibles, hit it, one after another. Perfect. Verse 3. And the one in heaven who was alive or under the earth was able to shut up four or five of the seals. Verse 4. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Verse 5. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has turned strong. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Wonderful. Six. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though in, it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Verse seven. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Verse eight. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a heart, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. <gasps> Did you all see what verse 8 says? God collects every prayer. And Mariana just read that to us. The golden bowls, which are the prayers of the saints. Hey, look up for a second. Have you put any in your bowl today? If you prayed today, God collected it. Have you thought about that? Bonnie and I have eight children. Every time they write a note, every time they would you know, scribble on something and say it was something, they'd give us this present, I kept it. You see how many boxes of these things I have, all these little notes and little things they made and everything, because the children were so precious that if they wanted to make me something, I wanted to keep it. Can you imagine how precious your prayer is to God? Your prayer goes from right in this room or wherever you are, right in front of God. It says those bowls are in front of his throne. When you pray, it takes you right in front of the throne of God. You're right in the center of everything. That's why Paul said, pray without what? Wow, don't stop praying. We're supposed to pray all the time. Okay, now it's my turn to read verse nine. Now we get to see the redeemed proclaiming it. See, that's what verse 9 is all about. And so they sang a new song saying, verse 9, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us. There is redemption. Redemption is when you're purchased by someone else. You have redeemed us, you purchased us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Wow. When that event took place, Jesus said something. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 19 on the cross? He said to Telestai, as he's, the, as he's hanging there, he pulls in very labored a breath and he goes, to Telestai. Now in the English movies, they all go, it is finished. But he only said one word. Tetelestai in Greek means it is finished. What does that mean? It's paid in full. Now, I want you to think about something. I'll do a little mathematics for you. Uh, since I don't all know most of you very well, I'll just do my mathematics, okay? I was born in 1956 just after Abraham Lincoln was born. 
And uh, just teasing you. Oh, I shouldn't do that because those of you that are not English speaking might think I know Abraham Lincoln. I don't. I was born here. I understood the gospel for the first time here. 1962. I was age six. I got saved. This is today, 63 years later. And any day in the future, I'm ready for the Lord to say, it's time for you to go home. When I was born in 1956, Jesus died on the cross 1,956 years before. When I was saved and called on the Lord, Jesus died on the cross 1,962 day, years before. Uh, today, it's been over 2,000 years, and it will still be whenever I die. Now watch. All the sins I committed from 1956 to 1962, all those sins were instantly forgiven me when I called on the name of the Lord. If that's true, say amen. amen. <laughs> if that's true, say amen louder. Amen. There you go. I like that. Oh, some of you could be Baptists. Uh, also, now, this is what you need to think about. At the instant I called on the name of the Lord, because Jesus died 2,000 years ago, he instantly forgave me of all my sins, but I haven't stopped sinning. Because as long as we're on earth, until we're glorified, we still sin. So guess what? the instant that I called on the name of the Lord in 1962, Jesus also had forgiven me of all those sins. Have you thought about that? Do you know how some people operate? They know that they got saved, but after that they keep thinking, I might do one too many. I might have just done for the 19 millionth time some sin, and the Lord's going to go, kick me out. Did you know there's actually Christians that way? There are whole parts of Christianity, many of them are charismatics, who lose their salvation. They really do. And they go around sad, and they tell people, I sinned again, and I lost my salvation. And someone will come with them and pray with them, and, and they get it back. That is such an improper view of the Bible. Jesus said in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, you know what's interesting? That was written in Greek and there's grammar. The word confess is a present, active, indicative verb, and that means I'm constantly confessing my sins. So I'm supposed to always be agreeing with God that I sin. This is an aorist verb, which in Greek means once and for all in the past. So once and for all in AD 30, Jesus from the cross paid for my sins from when I was born till I got saved, from when I was got saved until today, and from today until my last breath. Do you understand? Jesus said it's finished. He's not continuing to pay for, he's not going back to the cross to pick up today's for you, for me. It's finished. Now, when I used to be, I don't have my pen, I'll use one of these. I used to be a youth pastor. Can you tell I run all around and talk loud and everything else? And I taught teenagers, many of them about your age, and uh, I used to say I'd like to illustrate salvation's big three doctrines. Here I am, dead. This, I am this pen and I'm dead in my trespasses and sin. And Jesus came to me and redeemed me. That means he came and bought me. I'm here in the slave market of sin, dead to God, and he redeemed me. And then he justified me. See, I'm down here, and here's where God is. That's what's called justification. He makes us a saint. 
on the break, I went up and I said, what to you? What did I call you? Saint Leo. Can all of you say hello, Saint Leo? Can you say hello, Saint Joy? Hello, Saint Isaac. Hello, Saint Lydia. Did you know if you're saved, hello, Saint Brian. Did you know that if you're saved, you're a what? Saved. Why? Because I told you? Because the Catholic Church tells you? Who's the only one that can make you a saint? Yeah. And this is when he does it. See, I would teach my high school students, I said, you can learn the three biggest doctrines with your Bible and a pen. Put the pen on there, you're dead in your sins, and Jesus comes to you in the slave market and redeems you. That means he purchased me, and he elevates me. He gives me the standing in Christ, Christ's righteousness, that I'm a saint. But watch, this is the hardest part of the Christian life. Here I am, here's God, and God's wanting me to get closer and closer to him, and I'm not so sure I want to. And God wants me to get closer and closer to him. It's like this. Lord, I love you, but I don't have enough time to read your word. You need to read my word. I don't want to read your word. Well, you need to memorize. I don't want to memorize your word. Do you see that? Do you know what that process is called? Sanctification. Me getting closer and closer and closer and closer to the Lord. I can surrender and get really close, or I can resist him, as many believers do, and not be very close. Those are the three big doctrines. Because I'm redeemed, Jesus destroyed the record of my sins. Look, there is no record. Watch this. God does not even have a record of what I did from 1960, or 56 to 62. Now, my mother did. She always reminded me how bad I was. When I was in school in America, they used to still paddle people, and the principal had this the principal was only four feet five. She was this little lady. Vera Ralia was her name. She was about this tall. And she had a paddle that was almost as long as she was tall. And she'd get us over her desk and wham, as hard as she could. Now, I deserved it. I used to do all kinds of bad stuff. One time I started a fire in the bathroom. I thought, all this paper in here, I wonder if it would burn. And I put a match in the <laughs> trash can. Uh, I mean, I used to take all the girls' purses and I'd throw them up so they'd get caught in the, you know, up in the stuff, the light fixtures and everything. And then they'd have to bring a ladder and they'd have to climb up there and the janitor would come and it would just mess up the whole, I mean, the poor teacher didn't know what to do with me. In fact, much of my life in school and Sunday school, I spent right here. <laughs> the teacher would say, Johnny, go stand in the corner. That's how bad I was. And guess what? There is no record of that. Except with all the kids and teachers and everything. God erased the record. Now, do you realize that? Because I'm redeemed, Jesus destroyed the records of my sins because he took my punishment. And God doesn't double, double punish. If Jesus was punished on the cross for my sins, then he gets the punishment and the record of doing the sins. God treats Jesus on the cross like he committed all my sins from 1956 to 1962. God treated Jesus on the cross like he's committed all my sins up through today. And he erased the record. Do you think your sins are erased? Do you act like your sins are erased? Do you know what the devil likes to do? He likes to say, Bex, I remember what you did. And you know what we're supposed to say? Jesus doesn't. And my sins are gone and will never be remembered. Satan likes to accuse us. And he likes to use people to accuse us. People come up and they say, I know what you're really like. And you say, like Paul, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Did you know I'm the worst sinner I know in the whole world? I don't know why Bella sins. I know why Lydia sins. I don't know why Brian sins. But I know why I sin. 
I am the worst sinner I know personally in the whole world. Not some murderer in the prison or some wicked profligate. I am the worst sinner because I know myself. And Jeremiah says I'm desperately wicked. By the way, what else did Jesus wipe out? All my sins from today to the end. It's destroyed. Because I'm redeemed, Jesus is all I need. Once I realize that I'm forgiven, he's all I need. That's why the saints did so well in the early days being persecuted. They didn't need their house. They didn't need their job. They didn't need their family. They needed only Christ. That's really the, the hope we have, that Jesus will never fail me. Jesus bought me from the slave market at a high price. So, 1 Corinthians 6 says, I belong to God. When Jesus came and bought me out of that slave market, now he owns me. And I belong to him. And that is wonderful. Because I'm redeemed, my sins are forgiven forever. He's not going to come back in heaven and say, oh, by the way, Lydia, I still have this list, and now I'm going to give it to you. He says, they're gone. Psalm 103 says, as far as the east is from the west. Because I'm redeemed, God bought me through redemption. I am God's workmanship. God starts working on me. He starts changing me. He starts making me for his glory. And God will finish, Philippians 1, 6, what he started. Because I'm redeemed, I'm set free from any bondage. Uh, there is no sin that has to enslave me anymore. I don't have to be angry. I don't have to be impatient. I don't have to be bitter. I don't have to be lustful. I don't have to be fearful. And guess what? Neither do you. Did you know we should lay aside the sins that so easily beset us? Because Jesus has has broken the hold that sin has on us. And he takes and sets us free. Because I'm redeemed, I'm going to worship the Lord forever. That's what, that's what they're doing in Revelation 5, 9. Now, real quickly, we, we have to get moving here. What's the context God gives for the tribulation? You know, the tribulation is something a lot of Christians are embarrassed of because why would a loving God kill everybody, right? Why would a loving God massacre half the world? I mean, this is a massacre like has never happened before. God is going to kill every other human being, actually 60%, not 50. 60% of all living humans. How many are alive today? 7.3 billion. That means that 3. Point what? 3.75 billion people will die. Why? Well, in your reading, it was this scroll that it talks about in Revelation 5. They were saying, who will open the scroll? And, and you know, John Webb said no one was able. And then the Lamb came forward. The scroll is actually the title deed, the ownership document of the universe. Jesus um, says, I own the universe. I created the universe. I made all these people. And I have a plan for them. And basically, the tribulation is the answer to centuries of prayer. Now, how many of you know the Lord's Prayer? Let's say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom. That was really good. The Lord's Prayer is not a prayer that the purpose of it is to repeat it like we just did. Rather, the Lord's Prayer is something he's collecting, but it says in Matthew 6, after this manner, pray. The word manner means pattern. In, in Matthew 6, 9, he said that the Lord's Prayer is a pattern. If you look at it closely, it actually has seven parts. I want to show it to you real quickly. The first thing it is, our Father who art in heaven, I'm saying, God, I want to focus on who you are. You're sitting on that throne. You're the perfect Father in heaven, and, and, and you're ruling everything. I need to stop and think about that. Then I say, thy kingdom. The word kingdom means rule. Do you know what that means? I'm inviting God to control me. 
Do you know what I'm supposed to do every day? Do you know what you're supposed to do every day? When Javaris jumped out of bed at 5 a.m. before he went to the weight room and started lifting weights and everything else he does, do you know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to stop and focus on God and say, God, I invite you, your kingdom, to rule in my life today. I want you to control me. Did you know I still do that? This morning I got up at, Bonnie caught me, it was 4.18. I didn't get up at 4 o'clock, I got up at 4.18. When I got out of bed, I stood for a moment on this little circle on the floor. I see it every day. And I stood there, and I said, Lord, the only thing I have to give you is my life today, and I ask you to control me and use me today. I focused on God. I invited him to control me. Then I say, thy will be done. You know what I'm asking him? I want you to lead me through this day. I want, I want to do what you want me to do in each situation. I know I won't do it perfectly, but I want you to lead me, and I, I'm asking you to. Then I say, Lord, supply me. Give me this day what I need. Did you know why the Lord says daily bread? He wants us to need him all day long. That's why it says daily bread. You know what most people want? Yearly bread. They want enough to last for a whole year. God says, no, I want you to need me every day. That's why that that's the center of the prayer. There's seven petitions. The first three, and then the middle one is supply me, and then this cleansing stuff, forgive me. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The Lord says we have to forgive everyone of everything because God has already forgiven us of everything. Uh-oh. A lot of Christians have things they don't want to forgive. People hurt them too much. Every church has bitter people in it. They feel like someone harmed them, that uncle molested them, and it's wicked that he did, but that uncle is going on happily doing whatever he's doing, and that person is tormented the rest of their life with bitterness over what the uncle did, instead of releasing. You know what forgiveness means? You don't make the person not get punished. You just release the punishment to God. Forgiveness, the Greek word atheomi, means to release. I hold that hurt, I'm bitter, but I release that hurt, and God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. So I'm not supposed to hold on to all the hurts and harms people have done. I'm supposed to release them to the Lord. And that's when he cleanses me, so I'm not bitter, and I can go on with life. And then it says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Protect me. God's the only one that can protect me. And I ask him to do it every day. And then I say, empty me, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Life is all about you, God. It's not about me. So that becomes what, on page 368, I call the redemption-driven life. Because I'm redeemed, because I'm bought at a price, because God owns me, because my sins are forever forgiven, I live differently. I'm redeemed. I know it. I belong to God. I am his temple. He, he lives within me. He, he is dwelling in me. And I want to live for him. But what does happen when God finally answers the prayer of all the people? You know, we're praying and saying, Lord, uh, help these people to get saved, and Lord, right all wrongs, and bring justice, and all that. What happens when all the prayers of all the saints for all the centuries are unleashed. Now, now back to Revelation. We have to finish. We haven't finished Revelation 5 yet. Let's go back there and let's see. Sarah gets verse 9 and grace, right? In your biggest voice, you get 10. Bex. 11, Big Brian, 12, Isaac, 13, and Sue? No, um, Jane, sorry. I'm old, I forget quick. You get the last verse, okay? Good, Sarah. And I say when you so say, you are ready to take the scroll and to open its seal because you are slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God's blessing from every tribe and language and people and nation. We have made them to be kingdom and priests to serve our God. 
Wonderful. Verse 11. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands. Verse 12. Good. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and strength and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Wonderful. Verse 13. Verse 13, good. Good. 14. That was 14. Oh, 13. Oh, did you read 13? I can't count. I'm just enjoying you guys reading so much. Did you see what happens here? All of that blessing and honor and glory and everything and then God starts answering. That's what the tribulation is. It's God righting all wrongs, God finding every murderer and making him answer for it, God finding every person that oppressed, every poor, helpless person, every, every wicked king, every wicked judge that perverted justice, God gets even with all of them. That's what the tribulation's about. He first does the people that are alive, and he does that all the way through chapter 20, and then he resurrects everybody that's dead, and finalizes it. Now, what does that mean? What happens to all of our prayers? Never forget, God collects them. He says that twice. Revelation 5, 8, Revelation 8, 3. God collects your prayers. Secondly, God calls both Old and New Testament believers saints. Now think about this. When Jesus died on the cross, Adam was back here, Noah was back here, right? Enoch was back here, Abraham was back here. Every believer is saved the same way. It's just the people in the Old Testament were saved looking forward to the cross. They believed that the lamb or the ram or whatever they were offering portrayed a substitute that was coming, and all of us look back. See, that's... The essence of salvation is that by one offering on the cross, Jesus forever erased the sins of all those who lived and trusted in him before the cross and all those who will live and trust in him after the cross. God calls Old and New Testament believers saints. On page 382, when God gets to write the lyrics... Boy, this is something all these songwriters should pay attention to. When God gets to write worship songs, what words does he use, you know? What, what's kind of the content? Well, he always makes himself the center of attention. And to show us how important words are, God has 14 songs in Revelation. Did you know that? There are 14 songs. And the words of the first song we already just read. Let me show you all of them. Right there they are. 4, 8, 4, 11, 5, 9, 5, 12, 5, 13, 7, 10, 7, 12, 11, 15, 16, 16, 19, 19, 19. And this is who's, who's offering this doxology. Doxa means glory. Logia means the, the, the uh, record of it. So it's the record of the glory offered. Uh, and, and who received the worship? God the Father, God the Father, the Lamb, the Lamb, God the Father and the Lamb, God the Father and the Lamb, the Father, the Father, the Father and the Lamb, the Father, 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 Father. Isn't that interesting? God the Father is the focus of worship. And we worship through the Lamb of God, we worship the Lamb of God, and the Holy Spirit energizes us to do it. Well, before we go, how should the book of Revelation impact our lives every day? That's a good question. The first way it should impact our lives is to realize God's on the throne. When you went to Israel, did you guys quote that verse that um, uh, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people? When we take people over there, we always pause and show them that when you're in Jerusalem and you go like this, all the way around the city, you see the, the Judean mountains. They're all the way around. 
Now, think about this. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, the Lord surrounds his people. When it's nighttime and you can't see the mountains, are they still there? When it's nighttime and you can't see the mountains, do they go away or are they still there? When we're going through nighttime experiences in our life where everything is hard, is God still surrounding us just because we don't see him? See, that's what he was telling Israel. When there's a storm and you can't see the mountains, I'm still there. When it's night and you can't see the mountains, I'm still there. When you go blind and you can't see the mountains, I'm still there. The mountains surround Jerusalem like I surround my people. That's the first lesson you should learn from Revelation 4 and 5. Whether it's dark or light, God is surrounding. He's sitting on that throne. He's watching. That's what he wants us to know. But how does God's word guide us to understand disasters? We just had the... Australia thing. What was that, a month ago, where that crazy guy killed 50 people in the mosque in Australia? Did you all hear about that? A man broadcast on Facebook Live, he put a camera on his assault rifle in Australia, connected a camera to his gun, and walked in while he was broadcasting for one hour on Facebook. I mean, millions of people watched this happen as it happened. And he started going, <laughs> killing people. And he killed 50 people in a row on Facebook while everybody was watching. Wow. How does God's word guide us to understand massacres, disasters? Do you remember the tsunami about 12 years ago that hit Indonesia and killed 200,000 people, one wave came across Indonesia, missed, aren't you glad it missed Jeju? I mean, that wave was like 50 to 100 feet high. Can you imagine if that would have hit here? It went way inland. How does God's word guide us to understand disasters? Real quickly before we go, if someone ever asks you that, you say, I know, it's in Luke 13. Okay, if there's a disaster tomorrow, Isaac, and people said, what does God think about that? What would you say? Look in, no, look in Luke 13. What, no, Revelation illustrates it, but Luke 13 is the answer. So turn in your Bible, Luke 13, before we go. See, that's why you come to the Bible Institute. People are going to think that you understand the Bible, and you do. And people are going to look at you back home and for the rest of your life as having something they never had. The majority of people in this world will never go to a Bible Institute and be taught the Bible. The majority of people. You have a responsibility. People are going to ask you, they're going to say, Brian, what does God say about that? Bex, does the Bible say anything about that? Isaac, does the Bible say anything about that? And you know what you can say? I can answer any question. You can ask me any question you want, and I can answer. Most of the times I'll say, I don't know, but I'll check. But most of the time, you should have an answer. And so when someone asks you, does God's word tell us anything about disasters, massacres, and bad things that happen to us? You say, mm-hmm. Look at chapter 13, and I'll read it. No, maybe we should, no, we don't have time to have the back row read it. I'll pick up with you guys later, okay? And there were some present in that season who had told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now that's kind of like a calm way of saying that a group of Jews, you guys, were walking, holding their lambs, walking across the temple like this, when all of a sudden Roman soldiers came and pulled their swords out and slashed and killed the people and the lambs they were carrying. Their blood was mingled with their sacrifices. So here's a dad and his wife and their kids, and they were walking across the temple courtyard, and these soldiers run out and kill dad and kill mom and killed the lamb and killed all the kids and left them laying on the ground. The blood of the sacrifices and the mother and the father and the kids were all just all over the pavement. That's an event that happened in history that people were still wondering about in Jesus' day. It had happened 
a couple of years before Jesus was in the temple. Pilate just got upset with the Jews. They were always doing something, so he decided he was going to teach them a lesson. He sent his soldiers and said, kill every one of those people down there in the courtyard. And they did. What do we call that? A massacre. So Jesus is put on the spot. People wondered, how, how do you reconcile that with your loving God? And Jesus and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse than all the other Galileans because they suffered such a thing? You know what our first thought is when we hear of a disaster? We think, well, maybe they deserved it, you know? We do think that. When, when we don't get in a car accident and someone else does, we go, well, probably they deserved it. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell. You guys go to the Pool of Siloam? Did you know there used to be a tower next to it? This gigantic tower that reached up in the, in, you know, several stories high. And there were a bunch of people sitting with their feet in the water, the Pool of Siloam, like you guys were there looking at that site. And all of a sudden that tower crumbled and fell and crushed all the people. And that's another historic event that we know about. And Jesus said, the 18 that the tower of Siloam fell and killed, do you think they were sinners more than all the other people who died in Jerusalem? Do you think disasters happen because you're bad? No, I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. The lesson Jesus gives is that uh, God wants us to learn. And God answers that God tells us that disasters and massacres and bad things happen all around us and, and most of us are experiencing a lifetime of tragedies. I mean, if you watch the news, you're seeing all these disasters and everything. And what Jesus, his message for all this is, every disaster and calamity should remind us that either we've repented or not, either we're going to heaven or not, and you should be ready today, Leo, to go to heaven. Did you know I witnessed people that way? I go up and I say, hey, Isaac, if this building collapsed on you today and you were crushed underneath it, where would you wake up? In heaven? Or in hell. And you know what, when I say that to people, do you know what almost 99% of them do? They go, to see if it looks like it's going to fall while I'm talking to them. They haven't even thought of the roof falling in on them. And they go, and then I say, I'm just asking you. Disasters and calamities happen all the time. Have you repented? Okay, time to go. The question is, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to meet the Lord? Are you ready to go see him? Are you ready to stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ? Martin Luther, remember him, the great reformer, lived from 1483 to 1546. Do you know what he said? My favorite quote. I have two days in my calendar, today and the day I stand before Jesus Christ. So my question for you is, are you getting ready for the greatest day of your life when you're going to stand in front of Jesus Christ and he's going to say, Bex, what did you do with the precious life I gave you, Emily? What did you do with the precious life I gave you? Kirsten, what did you do? See, that's how revelation impacts us. We start thinking about the ending. You're a great class. Have a great weekend. I'll see you Tuesday. Oh. Uh, appointments with John and Bonnie. Uh, we're, Bonnie and I are going to put out on that bulletin board a, a slot where all of you boys, you can sign up for a slot talking to me if you want to talk. No, you don't have to talk to me. I'll talk to you. <laughs> Ladies, uh, Bonnie will have slots for you to come and meet with her all alone. Plus, I would like you all next week to start saving us a seat. Bonnie would like to sit with some of you girls. And I will go for about three minutes or five or ten without holding her hand to let her go sit with you guys. And some of you guys, there are nine of you, you should all save me a seat at a meal and say, come sit with me because I just want to talk to every one of you and get to know you. And so does Bonnie. Okay? So we have appointments. We would love to meet with every one of you all alone and talk. And I would love to eat our meals with you. Okay? God bless you. Sorry to keep you. See you.